Here are some brief remarks on big data systems as part of the overview or introduction to big data applications and analytics. And I'm Jeffrey Fox again. And here we go. Well, here's some general remarks. I keep making this point. Public clouds, there's no point in arguing about them. They're here. And they're becoming much more diverse and powerful with GPUs and FPGAs and high speed networks and low speed networks and big memory and little memory and so on. There's a lot of wonderful software, including HPC computing software for parallel computing. Whereas the dominant software, just because it's the dominant application, is commercial big data, where the Apache Foundation has the, um, what we call the, uh, Apache Big Data software stack, which uh, encompasses all sorts of both data center and edge computing, including streaming data and batch data. Although it's not generally discussed, it is obvious that big data requires high performance computing because big data is big and you want to process it fast. And the whole purpose of high performance computing is to process things fast. The only slight subtlety is that high performance computing or HPC originally focused on simulations and big data focuses on data. But running computers fast is running computers fast, whether it's data or simulations. Now we have service oriented systems, that's a dominant trend. We have the Internet of Things, a dominant trend. And we remember we have the total edge device on the edge, and then we have a little gap to the fog. Then we have the edge, and then we have the data center. And uh, there are lots of different communities in this world, and they're pretty confused because they actually discuss the same thing from different points of view. But I don't think it's actually, there is much confusion. The situation is pretty clear. And cl high performance clouds will become a dominant technology used by lots of people, and we'll probably use Jupyter Notebooks to access them in science. Here is an update on. Clouds of August 2020, and um, we've already mentioned this number: 35 billion dollars spent on cloud infrastructure services in the last quarter, um, and um, that was a 10% increase in the previous quarter. And uh, as I pointed out from Cisco, around 94 to 95% of enterprise computing is done on clouds, and um, the clouds are divided. Um, Microsoft is catching up Amazon, um, but Amazon is still number one. Uh, Google is well below both of them, but still quite viable. Alibaba from China is doing pretty well. And then, but there's still 37% others. IBM, Oracle are obvious vendors in that category, important vendors. Um, there are also companies like Salesforce, which use clouds intrinsically uh, and effectively make use of their clouds to support uh, customers, but in an application specific fa fashion. The uh, CRM, Customer Relations Management. Now here I wanted to point out, this, this is a slightly different tack. That's the end of the basic infrastructure. We have the whole process, which I like to call data information knowledge wisdom. And we, you take data, that's on your, your machines, your genome sequences, your satellites uh, um, observing the Earth, or your Hubble device. That then gets pre-processed to become information. Then we run your deep learning and it becomes knowledge. And then finally, from the collection of knowledge becomes wisdom and decisions. Once the community accepts a certain approach, somehow the same thing gets relabeled wisdom or community knowledge. And as we go down this chain, the actual volume of data goes down. I pointed out that in physics, the volume of data drastically decreases between the um, between the raw data taken at uh, CERN, tens to hundreds of petabytes a year, down to the uh, AOD, uh, which is the uh, final form of data where we do the analysis, which is actually even smaller than that because you use tags, which are the metadata to select data you want to want to look at. This is a slide I drew a long time ago, which is meant to represent this edge to center and uh, data to wisdom process. Here we have the edge, everything, 
which includes both actual devices on the edge. Here's a webcam, here's a telescope, um, here is a cell phone. And those get, um, <coughs> these are all sensors, they convert, they, those sensors get staged into the cloud. They run through the filters, this is the initial data engineering. They run through uh, filters to actually discover things, the final deep learning. Then it all gets fused on the cloud and then accessed through a portal. And everything is like this, and we have other you, here we have computer systems, but we have other computer systems like this one here, which are feeding data into this process. So we have the totally distributed set of sources of data from aircraft to computers to geo, geoscience sensors or water gauges, and those get funneled through centralized data centers and large scale training, and then they get Either they get used on the edge again to control your your favorite uh, self-driving car, or they get used uh, to make decisions and create wisdom. But DIKW is a very old idea. I think actually I taught it in my first class. I came to Indiana in 2001. All right. So here's an example of DIKW from Google Maps. So the original data could be the maps from USGS and satellites, the overlays. The information is the, is the presenter of all that information on the Google Maps web page. Then we will find a, a driving route on that web page, that's knowledge. And then we make a decision, which way to go, DIKW. Now we have a little discussion about um, Parallel computing, which is my expertise. And uh, this is where high performance computing originally started doing parallel computing to, to say solve aerodynamics problems, to study motion of aircraft in the, in the air. Or we'll say a new battery was another example I gave, a fusion reactor, and uh, or your favorite uh, nano, nano system with new materials, and those chop up the problem into different parts, which produce so-called maps, which then run on each part, and then they coordinate themselves by sending messages to each other. And, and a really big job of this type can actually use 100,000 cores or more on the same job. And all of these are run on giant DOE, NSF, NASA facilities, and every one of those runs at 99.99999 or equivalent utilization, because they get in disgrace if they don't. They're pretty fragile for faults, and um, they're not sensitive, they're not, they, cannot, they can't allow outliers where one map or computation takes a lot longer than the others. Clouds is a much more asynchronous, loosely coupled situation with lots of independent jobs. These are lots of dependent jobs. Here we have lots of independent jobs, which are, which are processing the search results from seven billion people, all querying about, uh, querying um, the central cloud about something. And there, that map produces of the same general type of computation. The map is the independent searches uh, of the different parts of the search space and the reduce is the journey of those independent searches together. It's highly fault tolerant because there's no, there's not closely synchronized, and there is a special case of this with no reduction. You just do maps only, where everything is independent. Then we sort of join everything together. We have HPC plus clouds or HPC clouds. We have iterative map produce, which effectively converts map produce to the model used by HPC with the famous message passing interface software, which is a communication library. Here is a picture of MapReduce. Here we have our instruments that it goes to disks. And then you have this model where we have the data is associated with the computing. And so that's what all these things are. Here we have these different data that from different, different genome sequences, which are running separately in each node of your machine. And then they're exchanging information to, to make certain words studying the same problem. This is iterative map produced, which is not the typical, uh, at least historically, not the typical um, 
the data problem, although deep learning is iterative map produced, if you look at it in the right point of view. But everything is always a mixture. It's really useful to think of maps, which is reading data, writing data, doing computation and reductions, which are joining the results of um, different maps together. And that's a very good computing model.